continue through the book of Matthew in six weeks leading up to Easter. It's kind of our version of Lent. So uh, we're going to talk about what that looks like in a minute and why Lent is a thing and all that. But we're going to take you through the book of Matthew. And I, I, you got a packet tonight. Everybody get a packet? Okay, so that packet, at some point, we're going to open that all up, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But I want to show you on the screens where we're headed for the next six weeks, so can you put that on the screen for me? So um, tonight, we're talking about Jesus as our display model, Matthew 3 and 4. Next week, we're talking about Jesus as the disciple maker, Matthew 4. Jesus as divine, Matthew 5 through 8. Jesus deliverer, Matthew 17 and 21. We're just, we just are kind of highlighting the book of Matthew for six weeks so that you know who Jesus actually is. Uh, the week before Easter, Jesus is our designated sacrifice, and we're going to talk about the cross and the crucifixion. And then Easter week, Jesus is the defeater of death. <laughs> is that not good news, church? <laughs> so tonight, in honor of reading Scripture, if you have your own Bible, we're going to be in Matthew 3 and 4. Um, it's going to come up on the screens. This is the story we're going to talk about tonight. This is the kind of introduction to Jesus as an adult. And it just starts like this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to... Uh, to John to, at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need, you to be, I need to be baptized by you and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said, permit it now to be so for the, thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. And when he'd been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened. Everybody say the heavens were opened. The heavens were opened. And he saw the spirit of God descending. Everybody say the spirit of God descends. Like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son. <laughs> That's how God talks. I don't, I don't know. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Everybody say, God spoke. God spoke. Now, you'd think this is the end of just one story, and it's just the ending of a story, but the, the, the numbers were not in the Bible when the Bible was written. Right, right. So the story isn't over then. So he gets baptized, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This is immediately after the baptism happens. Like, like it's not like second story, it's the same story. Yeah. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. That would be apparent. Um, now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the devil took him up on, the, on a holy city and set him up on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again, the devil took him up to the exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. Uh, by the way, the the book of Luke says he showed him all the kingdoms of the world because he had them. See, when Jesus comes to earth, he is defeating the devil because the devil owned all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you'll just fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and, and ministered to him. Uh, now, there's a little aside after this that Matthew kind of makes, and then verse 17, Matthew kind of picks the story back up, and it just says, from that time, everybody say, from that time. <laughs> Jesus began to preach, and he, sa he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the way that Matthew introduces Jesus. He introduces him with the water and the wilderness and a witness. We're going to talk about the water, the wilderness, and the witness of Christ, and I want you to understand that there's something in this that Jesus is hoping that you grasp for yourself. Let me just pray for a second. Jesus, oh, I am so happy that you came to earth, that you were baptized, that you were affirmed by the Father, that you defeated the devil. And then you began to preach for, behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you invited people to follow you and to love you and to worship you. Tonight, as we open your word, as we study who you are and what you are about, all about, help us understand who you really are. May we know you and follow you and worship you. And may you transform our hearts as we see you clearly. Everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Transform me by your word. Lead me now, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Why don't you give somebody a holy elbow and tell them, thanks for hanging out in church with me and you can be seated. <laughs> we're going to come up with a weird way to say hello every time. I don't know what we're going to do, but we'll figure something out. Um, if you have a note sheet, 
can you grab that out? You can get that packet out too if you want to. And um, we're, we're not studying out of the packet tonight, but we're going to actually open it up and look at it in just a few minutes. Um, as, we, as we get going, uh, some of you know that Kelly and I went to visit Kelly's parents in Alabama a week or two ago, and we flew into Atlanta, uh, landed at the Atlanta airport, went to I went over to the car rental place because her, her parents' place is about two hours from there. So we go over to the car rental place and uh, we went to get our uh, rental car and all of them were gone. Anybody ever had that happen before? Like they just had rented them, like everything in our section because we were like, you know, like, like give us the Nissan Versa. <laughs> like just whatever the cheapest thing, no offense to the Nissan Versa drivers. Like, like <laughs> give us whatever the cheapest thing is that we can find. We want to drive that. And, like, like, and they were all gone. And so we were like, well, what do we do? And the girl goes, well, go pick whatever you want. I was like, really? So we, we looked, came over and I saw this truck, which is kind of cool because I prefer to drive a truck, especially like, I just, I'm just a truck guy. So I, like, I see this truck and then I turn and look across the aisle and there's a black Mustang GT <laughs> convertible. Yeah. So it was only like 45 degrees out, but we drove with the top down. <laughs> and I, I mean, I had a Mustang. I did. I had a Mustang when I first uh, turned 16. Um, it was 1981. Uh, it was a 1981 Mustang. And at the time, if you know anything about 1981 Mustangs, is they were all four cylinder, <laughs> unless you got like the hot, the real super hot. So I had a, I had a little four cylinder crappy Mustang. Um, it was that, this car, this was awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, when you pass a car and you put the, the pedal down, you get to a hundred really fast. <laughs> and and uh, I, I went fishing, I went fishing with my little nephew and he's like 15. And we passed this car and it kept climbing and climbing and climbing. And about 120, he goes, I can't stop smiling, my face hurts. <laughs> and it like, it would just, it would just, and you wouldn't even try to go fast, and it would just like, it would just take off, and you were like, oh well, I'm going way too fast, I should slow down now. It was awesome, I mean, it was super cool, and the only reason why I'm bringing this up is, but because the Mustang GT is kind of like their, they don't want you to buy the four cylinder, you know you can get that same exact car in a four cylinder still? Why do that? Now, to be fair, Kelly has a Dodge Charger and she bought the V6 instead of the V8 because it was the only one that came with all wheel drive and we lived in the country and we we're gonna end up in a ditch otherwise. <laughs> so I get it a little bit, but like, if you're gonna buy a Mustang like this, I, can, I, I, I don't know how much these things cost, but they, got, they must be a lot. Um, I but I got to rent it for a week and oh my gosh, it was incredible, the, 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 the display model, this Mustang GT was just killer awesome. And I'm only bringing it all up because um, maybe someday you'll get to rent one. I don't know, no, that's not really the point at all. The, the point is really this, uh, that is the ideal for the Mustang. Basically, oh, I know that there's the Cobra and there's all that, but it's basically the top of the line. It's what the ideal is. In the same way, Jesus is our ideal. Come on, say Jesus is our ideal. Now I was like, well, yeah, don't be a four-cylinder Christian was kind of how I thought about preaching. Um, and God kind of rebuked me. Studying Friday morning and I'm looking over this passage and he was like, there, there are no four-cylinder Christians. I made all of them five O's. I made every Christian with everything in them so that they could go zero to 60 and 3.5 miles an hour, that they could get to their destiny, that they could go exactly where God wanted them to be, that you are not a four-cylinder believer. When God saved your life, he, get, he internally built you up with everything necessary to handle everything you face. It is already in you to be all that God ever wanted you to be. It's already in there. I was like, wow. But what about verses like 1 John? And then I'm just gonna throw a couple verses on the screen. 1 John, those who, who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And Jesus would answer, and I will give you the power to do it. Yes. He doesn't just say, you should live like me. And then, oh, I'm not gonna give you any help. 
Matthew chapter 10, verse 25, it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master, that we are to be like Jesus. And you know what the scriptures also say? That God teaches us to be like Christ, that he is your teacher and he's leading you and he's guiding you and he's adjusting some things and he's changing some things, but he's going to make you like himself. You have all the, what about 1 Peter 2, 21? Jesus is your example or display model and you should follow in his following his steps. And he goes, okay, so that's why I put the Spirit of God in you. That's why I put my hand on your life. That's why I put favor on your life, so that you could step where I step and walk how I walk and talk how I, I, I talk. I want you to understand that God doesn't make Christians and then leave them like crappy little four cylinders. He's gonna take you as far as you need to go. You are gonna get to your destiny because it is in you. He is in you. Now that last verse I like a lot. Following his steps. Everybody say following his steps. Following his steps. In Matthew 3 and 4, there are like four little steps that Jesus takes. And he's teaching us, he's guiding us, he's empowering us. And he's saying, if you would step like I step. Remember when you were a little kid and it would snow? Aren't you glad there's no snow out right now? Yes, thank you, God. Um, when it would snow out there and your little kid and like your dad would walk out in the yard and he would go like, Pfft. And he'd make those big old footprints. What does every kid want to do? Walk in daddy's steps. I want you to understand that Matthew 3 and 4 is kind of God's guide empowering you to step like Jesus. That's what the text is about. In fact, there are only four things here that he says, and I want you to write them down. So if you have, if you have the note sheet, I'd love for you to just write a couple things down. First of all, baptism. Ever say baptism? baptism. This is our first step into the life of faith. Uh, sometimes people think, now, I know many of you have been baptized, but some people think the first step in, into a life of faith is church. The first step is not church. The first step is baptism. As we seek God, the first thing that we identify with, the way we step how Jesus stepped and walk how Jesus walked, is that there's a moment where we die to our old ways. We go out into the water, and our old is killed off, and we come up from the water, and we say, I just, I just follow Jesus. Um, I'm going to throw a picture up on the screen. This is uh, me baptizing Pastor Ben in Israel several years ago. That's, that's the Jordan River, and it's raining on us. And uh, that's one of those spots that's sacred because it's where Jesus was baptized. And now, you know what's interesting about Jesus' baptism? When Jesus is baptized, three things occurred, and I had you say them out loud as we read the text. Huh. Matthew 3, 16, heaven opened. Everybody say heaven opened. Heaven. That's called favor. Anytime you see in the scriptures the heavens opened, yeah. it's about favor or blessing. Everybody say favor. favor. When you walk into a relationship with God and you get baptized, I want you to understand that heaven opens for you. At the moment of baptism, heaven opens and God's like, I, they get my favor. They get my blessing. Heaven is falling on your life. Like sometimes we say, hey, when service is over, you can come get baptized. We've got short shirts and towels and a pastor that love to baptize you. And all that's true. But there's something better than just hot water and a pastor. There's favor from God when you get baptized. That's pretty special. Secondly, the scripture says the spirit fell. Everybody say spark, the spirit fell. That's about power. Do you know Jesus hasn't done any miracles, but after, after the spirit falls, he does lots of them. It is after this that the miracles start to happen through Christ, that he is empowered to live out his destiny and his faith. And then third, it says the, the father spoke. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well. What? Now, that's kind of fascinating because that's affirmation. Everybody say affirmation. Uh, you know what's fascinating to me? A lot of people don't want to come to church because they think what God's going to say is, you suck, get your act together. They think if I follow God, he's going to be like, you better get that right. You better figure this thing out over here. And he like follows around after you, like correcting all your faults, telling you how jacked up you are, making you feel. But you notice that the, as soon as Jesus is like, man, I'm walking with God. The first thing God does, favor, power, and affirmation. There's nothing, is there anything negative in those three? 
So what do you have to fear from God? It tells you something great about who Jesus is. Remember the series is called Jesus Is. Jesus is the God of favor and he's the God of power and he's the God of affirmation. He's not the God of condemnation. He's not the God of fear. He's not the God of lack. He's not the God of worry. He's not the God of, of unforgiveness. God is the God of favor and affirmation and power and love and strength. And he's constantly trying to pour this on your life. This is who he is. So question, have you been baptized? Really, well, like right, like today? Like right, yeah. This is, this is the initiation process into the life of a Christian. This is, it's not just you read the Bible or you come to church. The initiation process of a believer is you get baptized. It is the first step in the life of faith. We say we want to be like Jesus, or remember the verse was, we want to follow in his steps. You're probably never going to walk on water like Jesus walked on water. I doubt you step where he steps and walk on water. Maybe, it, maybe it's true for him. Maybe I doubt it. You might possibly uh, heal the sick like he did. You, you might theoretically raise the dead. Uh, I, I guess it's possible, but probably not very likely. If you take five loaves and two fishes and you break them all up and all of a sudden you feed 15,000 people, it's theoretically possible, but not likely. On the other hand, you can step exactly where Jesus stepped, into water, and go down under the water saying, I don't live for myself. And I come up from the water saying, I only live for the glory of God and the goodness of God and the favor of God and the peace of God and the joy of God. And you know what heaven says? I will give you power and favor and affirmation, and I am so dang proud of you for taking this step. What if tonight was your night? Like I've actually been, we've been praying all week. Our, our pastors have been praying all week that you would not leave tonight till you've gotten baptized if you've never been baptized. Um, in fact, Pastor Ruben's up here in the front. Can you just stand to your feet? I want you to stand up so they, they see you. Um, <laughs> give it up for Pastor Ruben. Uh, when we first hired him to pastor here, you know what the, one of the first things he said to me was, can I do all the baptisms? It is like, it's like, this, like that is, that, that's the spirit he flows in. That's what he wants to do more than anything else. He likes to pray over somebody's life. He likes to see their transformation as they go down underneath the water and their old is gone and they come back up and they follow Christ. I, like he, he gets so stoked about this. That's why I always send everybody to him because he wants to do it every time. So what if tonight before you left, you got baptized. Yeah. Now, if some of you were like now humdrumming, oh, it's just baptism, there he goes again, talking about the one thing that caught, like, oh my gosh, favor falls. Right. Heaven's opened. Have you forgotten that heaven wants to smile at you? Like heaven wants to applaud you and empower you and strengthen you. And if all of this is there for you, and to get, get humdrum about baptisms, if a Christian ever gets humdrum about baptisms, they've forgotten that transformation matters. It's saddened to me sometimes, like, I'm just going to put this out there for the Christians. You've been a Christian a long time. You've been baptized like five, ten years. Oh, yeah, somebody else is getting baptized. I got to go. I got to go eat some dinner. People running out the door, like, like, stay around afterwards, applaud somebody. Like somebody's dying to their old life. They're resurrecting to something better. It is the best thing that could ever happen to a person. <laughs> baptism, step one into faith. And secondarily, as soon as the baptism is over, remember, this is one story. And so the second the baptism is over, he goes from the water to the wilderness. And I, I would just remind you that uh, after you've committed your life to Christ, I, I, I want you to know that there might be a season of wilderness for you. Um, he immediately is tempted by the devil. He's wandering around in a desert. But he's not just wandering. He's praying and fasting, right? So Jesus is also showing you something in the middle of your wilderness. Man, you got to be a person of prayer. Come on, say Prayer. Well, why, why, would I, why would I bring this up? Because a lot of people want to whine in their wilderness. I'm going to whine about the fact I'm in the wilderness. God, I decided to follow you. I got baptized. What am I doing out here in the wilderness? This isn't fair. You're mean. I don't know why I'm talking like I'm a redneck from the south. <laughs> it's 
Sorry. <laughs> Honey, I love you, even though you're from Alabama. <laughs> I'm from Iowa. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Iowa farm boy. Can't help it. Iowa proud. <laughs> Said no one ever. <sighs> Second step. There's prayer. He's not whining in the wilderness. He's praying in the wilderness. This is the daily step of faith. Everybody say daily step. This has to be the constant mantra of your life. When you get up in the morning and you hit your knees, before you go to bed at night, when you take a moment and you pray with your spouse, when, when you're in the middle of the day and you're praying before your meal and, and you're driving in the car and you're asking God for help and strength, this is the daily, you are walking like Jesus. You're stepping how Jesus stepped. Now this wilderness, I'm gonna give you a picture. This is the Sinai wilderness where, that's what the landscape looked like. It looks kind of like the moon. <laughs> where Jesus wandered in the wilderness for 40 days. I mean, it is, there, it's, it's a barren nothingness. No wonder he's fasting, right? There's nothing to eat. I mean, it's, it wasn't like it was an option. <laughs> That's why the devil comes and says, hey, turn that stone to bread, because everything's stones. No 7-Elevens, no Starbucks. He's just walking out and praying, and, he's, and he prays, and he prays, and he prays, and he prays. Now, you know what's really interesting? The book of Luke says this didn't even happen just once. It happened multiple times in the life of Christ. In fact, Luke 5, verse 16 says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Right. It was the normal part of his life that he would withdraw and pray and seek the face of God and say, God, what do you want me to do here? A couple months back, we preached on a series of messages around prayer, and, and the pastor started talking, and then, uh, we started praying more as a team, and that has developed for us. Like right, right now, the, the, what, what your pastors are doing is, if there's 40 hours in a work week, we are tithing four hours a week to God in prayer. Just like you tithe your resources, 10% of your income, you give it to God and you honor God with, God with it. We thought, well, if there's 40 hours in a work week, what if, what if we tithe four hours to God in prayer together? And so every Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday at 10 o'clock, we're in a room praying, and we're praying for you, and we're praying for your stories, and we're praying for our churches, and we're praying for favor and protection and strength. And like God, I want you to know that as we have prayed more, God has done more. Like it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that as we just have sought the face of God, like like because I, I, I want you to know that heaven is anticipating our prayers. It's like like remember I told you this before. Heaven's like at the edge of heaven, waiting for you to pray. Because if they would just pray, here we go, we're gonna go, boom, and they just come and they accomplish so much stuff on earth. This was the point of Lent. Originally, Lent started in about 100 A.D. Actually, uh, way back as far as that, but it was just uh, a week long praying and fasting. By about 325, it had moved into uh, 40 days of praying and fasting to reflect Jesus in the fasting in the wilderness. First observed about 325 in the present form. And the purpose was seeking the Lord for deeper relationship and anticipation of Easter. Like, okay, God, if there's ever a season we want to seek you, it is the Easter season. If there's ever a season we want to be close to you, it's the Easter season. I thought it was super cool because Mark, Wal Mark Wahlberg just did a little video after he got his ashes on his forehead from Ash, Ash Wednesday, and he was just encouraging people, hey, make sure whatever you do, that you're praying and fasting. And then somebody did an interview with him, and they were like, like talk about your faith. He's like, I tell everybody about my faith. I'm pu super public about my faith. And then, because everybody knows who Mark Wahlberg is. And then he was like, um, he's like, so talk about your prayer life for a second. He goes, well, I take a day or, or two off each week to, to not work out, but I never, ever give up my 20 minutes of prayer in the morning and my 20 minutes of prayer in the evening. Seeking God's faith and Going, moving, moving my heart to the things of God. And like, that's just the norm. Like, I was like, man, I wish I could have the favor that Mark Wahlberg has. I wish I had the resources Mark Wahlberg has. I wish I had the abs Mark Wahlberg has. <laughs> Maybe you should do what Mark Wahlberg does. <laughs> See, I want you to know that God is waiting for you to begin to become a person of prayer, that you actually seek the face of God like his son did. Because heaven wants to empower you. 
Heaven wants to move on your behalf. Heaven has so much healing in store for you. Heaven has so much destiny in store for you. There is so much in heaven stored up to bless your life. If you would just pray and ask God for God, this is what I need, this is what I'm after. I need wisdom, I need strength, I need power, I need healing, I need blessing, I need, what's keeping you from actually praying? In that packet we gave you, as part of it, we gave you what we're calling our Lenten prayers. I'm gonna put them up on the screen. You can read them later on in, in the packet on your own. It's just, we pray each person in our church will personally know Jesus more. Not that you just come to church, but that you actually, you walk out going, oh, I see Je- I want you to see Jesus as a person of prayer. And this motivates you to be a person of prayer. We pray all our people will become people of prayer and worship. We pray for our kids and our teens to become passionate, committed followers of Christ not just attenders of a church, right? And on and on that list goes. Now, some of you are like, okay, so what does this tell me about who Jesus is? Jesus is the God of answered prayer, guys. If anybody's gonna get, if any, like I want you to understand that if you're ever gonna pray to someone, make it be Christ the healer, the resurrected one. I'm going to throw this out there. You you don't need to pray through a saint. You can pray to Christ, the resurrected one. Why pray to a a dead saint when you could pray to a risen Lord? Like he invites your prayers. He wants your prayers. He is waiting to answer you. So what does your prayer life look like? Does it look like a list of things that you're, you're seeking God for? Like some people are like, man, I can't make a list. I can't, I, I would never pray. If I, I just need to talk to God. For, 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 for me, a lot of times my prayer, my prayer time tends to be walking. I go for a walk or I go for a drive and I'm just praying and seeking God and praying and seeking God and praying and seeking God. And this is where my relationship with God is developed and encouraged and empowered. What if you became a person of prayer, believing that Jesus is, come on, say, Jesus is is. the God of the answered prayer. prayer. That's why he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because he actually believes if you'll invite heaven to come to earth, you will get what you need. When I'm praying for somebody to get healed, I'm praying, God, in heaven, they don't have cancer. In heaven, everybody's free of cancer. Everybody's free of disease. So I invite heaven to earth, and I invite you to heal them now, because on earth, this person is sick, but in heaven, they are healed and whole. So you bring heaven to earth. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. This is what you pray. Visualize how people are in heaven. There is no addiction. In heaven, there is no disease. In heaven, there's no divorce. In heaven, there's no pain. In heaven, there's no depression. In heaven, there's no, like, I want you to understand that. Think about what they are like in heaven and then invite heaven to come to earth regarding that issue. Pray this over yourself. And watch God move. God is the God of answered prayer. Third, number three. Can you put that on the screen for me? There you go. Memorize, memorization of the word. Everybody say memorize the word. See, taking this step gives us victory over trials and temptation. And this is kind of cool to me because um, I'm looking at the clock. I'm going to make sure I get through this in time. Um, when Jesus defeats the devil, it's like the devil can't hit him with a single punch. It's like they're in this ring, and it's like two prize fighters. And this one prize fighter, the devil, remember, he's been around for thousands of years. He should be able to land a punch on this guy. And he keeps throwing punch after punch after punch, and he cannot land a punch. And the way Jesus defeats the devil again and again and again is he just keeps quoting Scripture. He just keeps quoting the Bible. In fact, he's hungry, so he's offered food. Man does not live by bread alone, he said. That's Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. He's offered an opportunity to show off and jump off the temple and float down. He responds, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. That's Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. He's offered power in exchange for worship. And he responds, you shall worship and serve only the Lord. That's Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. Did you know that many, many theologians believe Jesus' favorite book of the Bible was the book of Deuteronomy? When's the last time you read that one? See, he's quoting from the same book and the same book and the same book. A lot of theologians are like, this is the book that he probably loved the most. This is the one that he constantly is quoting and repeating. And you know what? Every time he's quoting it, he is defeating the enemy. 
There's not a moment in this story where Jesus loses a battle to the evil one, which makes a simple statement to me. Jesus is the God of victory. Come on, say, Jesus is the God of victory. Are you, are you trusting in your own strength to uh, overcome an addiction, or are you trusting the God of victory? Are you trusting in your own wisdom to try to make yourself just not be depressed anymore? Or are you trusting the God of victory? Who are you looking to to see God overcome or to see something overcome or overthrown? Or how, how are you going to see victory in your life if you don't trust the God of victory? See, I want you to understand that when Jesus is defeating the devil, he was already going to defeat the devil either way. He didn't even have to really waste his time with him. He's going to overcome him, but he was doing it for a reason. He was trying to get you to step where he steps. He was trying to get you to walk how he walked. He was trying to say, hey, if they would just think the same way I think and talk the same way I talk, I'm giving them the power to overcome trials and temptation. Which tells me something. Our key to conquering our trials and temptation is the word of God in our mind and in our mouth. See, what are you talking about and what are you thinking about in relationship to your problems? Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, as a man thinks, so is he. Said it before, what you think about, you're bringing about. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13, it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since they have the same spirit of faith, we also believe, and therefore what? How often do you quote scripture in relationship to your struggle? What's awesome is Kelly and I, like this, this happens almost on a weekly, actually, not almost, every week. I'll be like upset about something. I'll be like, Kelly, I can't believe, and she'll just quote a Bible verse back at me. And it's frustrating. <laughs> you know why? Because I can't believe I didn't think of that first. Because as soon as she quotes the Bible verse back at me in relationship to the issue, I'm like, oh, this isn't an issue at all. This isn't a struggle at all. This isn't a problem at all. What is coming, what, what are you thinking about and what are you speaking about in relationship to every struggle and problem and issue that you face? Every trial, every temptation is overcome by the word of God. So for Lent, what this means for us is we gave you in this packet, we gave you a daily devotional, a chapter to read from the book of Matthew each day for the 28 chapters in Matthew. And then a couple of them we had you even repeat because we thought they were so important. So that little packet, the biggest part of the packet is a giant devotional for you to just read a little bit and a little bit and a little bit every single day. Why? Because if you could put the word of God in your brain and it could start coming out your mouth, you could make progress in faith. The other part of this is this. Um, we're asking you to memorize one scripture passage every week for the next six weeks. Uh, in fact, every week we're going to give you one to memorize. In fact, it's on the sheet of paper we gave you tonight, the, this, little, this little packet. You can put that on the screen for me. Um, this week I just want you to ma memorize Matthew 4, verse 8. But he answered and said, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You know what that verse does? It stops cravings. I don't need that. I have him. Man does not live on bread alone. I'm really trying to stop, eat so much. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I'm really trying to stop smoking. Man does not live by bread alone. I, I, don't, I don't need to go to that craving. I'm really, I, 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 I need to put the bottle down. Man does not live on bread alone. I don't need this to survive. I have him to help me survive. What, what if this was the, I, I, we're going to ask you next week to quote it to somebody else in service. As part of the service next week, we're going to have to look at somebody else. Can you just quote Matthew 4, verse 4 to them? Why? Because we don't think church should be a place in which you go and listen to things. We think it should be a thing that's something that transforms your life, and it has to actually go in your brain and out your mouth and actually in order to transform you. So we want you to actually memorize some scripture and not just call yourself Christian but don't even know the Bible. How can your life be transformed if you don't know the book that was the power with which Jesus lived his life? you got to know the word. This morning, I'm, I'm doing a uh, Discovery Bible study. We're going to talk more about this next week uh, with a guy that is just brand new Christian. I actually led him to Jesus over the phone. 
about a month ago. It was fun. I was driving home from church one night, and he calls me and asks me questions, and I let him to Jesus over the phone. It was pretty fun. Um, so we started doing this little Discovery Bible study, and this morning he texted me and said, this is the verse that was on my, on my Bible app this morning. This is awesome. God is talking to me. And his faith is coming to life. You know why it's coming to life? Because the first thing he did when he got up in the morning was he opened up his Bible app. Like, you got to open up that Bible. you got to study the Word. Why? Because the Word is where the power is. When you skip the Word, you're skipping all the power of the Christian faith. So, first Jesus hits the water. He ends up in the wilderness where he prays and he's quoting Scripture and he's victorious. And then... After that, this is going to help somebody. He starts to witness. Sometimes I can't figure out, like, why is the people of church, people of faith, they never share their faith. They never talk about God. Because they're not in prayer and they're not in the word. Therefore, there's nothing in them that has a desire to even say anything about God. But as he's filled up in prayer, as he's filled up, in scripture, as it's kind of pouring out, like he just, he can't help it. It's a Bible's just coming out of him all over the place. Immediately he starts to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You know what he's saying? He's saying that God's close, God, he's not far. That God wants to help, that God wants to bring heaven down to earth, that God's so near. Imagine if, imagine if this became the normal routine of your life. Just telling people, hey, God's close. God is near. God wants to bless. God wants to help. God is so with you. The water and the wilderness and this prayer time and this, this, momentary, and this, this piece of Scripture is what causes us to want to be vocal about our faith. That's the last little step that Jesus takes. There's these four steps he's taken. He's taken the other three, and this last one is just point other people to God. The step makes our faith public. It's not just about ourselves. I would remind you, Jesus says, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. He says, if you're public about who you worship and who you love and who you exalt and who's important to you, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But a lot of times people are like, you know, shh, faith is a private thing. You know, it's like, no, can't really. And I would say then, where, where's your power, man? Where's, didn't, didn't God make you a 5-0? Didn't he put strength in you? Didn't he put character in you? Didn't he put the ability to stand tall in the midst of criticism, in the midst of somebody, somebody else said a mean thing about me because I'm Christian. Wine, wine, wine. You have the overcomer in you. You have the strength of God most high in you. We talk a lot, I don't think we brought it up in a couple weeks, but I'll bring it up now. In a second, Kelly, I'm gonna have you come and do the offering. Um, but we've been talking a lot over the last year about this thing we call the flywheel. We follow Jesus and we bless people and we point somebody else to Christ. I would just ask you, listen, I'm, just, I'm just asking a fair question to, to believers now. How did you bless somebody or point somebody to Jesus this past week? Because if our faith stays private, the world stays dysfunctional. If your faith stays private, if there is no public declaration that, hey, the kingdom, in fact, this is what Jesus says in Matthew 4, verse 17, for the time, from that time on, Jesus began to preach and he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And he said this for three years straight and the whole world changed. Which tells you one more thing about who Jesus is. Jesus is the one who points the way to heaven. There's nobody else. Muhammad did not point to heaven. He did not. Talk to you all about it after service if you want me to. Buddha did not point the way to heaven. Your mom can't point the way to heaven. Though I'm sure she's sweet. The only one that can point to heaven is the one that conquered death. Buddha's dead, and Muhammad's dead, and 
But there's this Jesus I know who conquered the grave, which is why we worship him, why we trust him. There is no other savior. There is no other way. There is no other leader. There is no other God. It is Jesus, only Jesus, who points the way to heaven. And then he says, hey, if you love me, if you follow me, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But then he, like that, and that's like, oh yeah, I know that part. But do you, know, do you know what he actually said here? But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. He just said, heaven and hell are real. Every person you face, you know, every person you come in contact with, every one of them headed to heaven or headed to hell. So he says, go and tell the good news. Man, I've given them a way. I've given them a chance. I've given them an opportunity. They can walk into eternity. They can spend life empowered and favored and blessed and strengthened. They can say no to hell and yes to heaven if they'll just follow Jesus. So here's my question. What if for the next four 40 days of Lent, you took this, the last thing we gave you in this little packet, we gave you a whole bunch of invite cards to our Easter services. And what if you took these little cards and you just said, you know what? I'm gonna bless people and point somebody to Jesus. I'm gonna point somebody else to faith. I'm gonna point somebody else. On the back of these cards, is not just like a direction to the church. It's the power of the word. It's the scripture verses that lead somebody to Jesus. Like you actually could lead somebody to Christ in your own community, in your town or in your workplace or in your school. It's right there on the card. So we're starting this 40 days of Lent. But I don't really care whether you follow Lent or not. What I care about is that you know who Jesus is. <laughs> Jesus is the God of affirmation and power. Jesus is the God of answered prayer. Jesus is the God of, of victory and of the word. Man, Jesus is the only one that's gonna point us to heaven. If we don't have Jesus, we have missed everything. I think about you to close your eyes and bow your head for just a second. When you think about your life and your heart as to whether or not you are a, a, fo a full-on follower of Christ or whether you are far from him. Tonight could be a moment where you start out and say, you know, yes to Jesus. I'm gonna follow him. I'm gonna love him. I'm gonna worship him. Your initial step could start tonight. You could get baptized. This could be such a moment for your faith journey. Together, let's just say, Jesus Christ, tonight I seek you. I worship you as God. You are the victorious one. You're the God of answered prayer. So tonight, answer my prayer. Forgive my sins. Take me to heaven when I die. Transform my soul. Lead me now. Help me know you in a better way. Help me walk with you and use my life to help somebody else. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen.